Okay, hi everybody, and um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much to CGFI for the invitation. So we're going to have a, a bit of a panel discussion now, um, as Matt just talked about, and the broad theme of sort of policy and regulatory frameworks. Um, this is a pretty broad topic. We've got a fantastic panel who will each be bringing quite a different perspective to that. So we're going to hear a little bit from each of the panelists. Um, I'll ask the panellists a few questions, and then we're going to open this up to the audience. So I hope you have lots of questions. Policy and regulation is usually a theme that kind of gets people going, but I invite you to ask our panel interesting and challenging questions. Um, I know there's one or two of you in the audience who are guaranteed to do that, so looking forward to that. Um, I should introduce myself. I've been sort of referenced a couple of times already. Um, <laughs> my name is Kate Levick. Um, I work for E3G, which is a climate policy think tank based here in London, also working internationally. I'm the director there of finance and resilience. And um, I had the pleasure with Ben Caldicott, the um, founder of CGFI, to um, co-host the secretariat for the transition plan task force, which has also been referenced. So that's been a fantastic collaboration. If you followed the work of the task force, you'll know that um, it produced its disclosure framework last October, setting out what a good transition plan looked like. And um, I know a number of people here in the room like, work directly on that. I can see lots of, sort of friends of TPT in the room as well. Um, it, we had sort of more than 150 organizations directly involved in the drafting of the TPT products. And then more recently in April, we've set out the final technical products, which included sort of final sectoral guidance across 40 sectors and deep dives on seven different sectors and um, a whole other set of documents as well. Um, what we are looking to see now, of course, is what the UK will do to fulfill the commitment it made at COP26 to regulate and require trans transition plan disclosure by, at the time, listed companies and financial firms. That got extended to all large companies in the latest green finance strategy. Um, and of course, it's in hand. We recently saw a publication from the Treasury about um, you know, how this forms part of the overall suite of um, sustainability disclosures and where it sits alongside ISSB implementation and um, other, other, other aspects that we might hear about today. But of course, we're about to have a new government. So <coughs> you never quite know what the future will bring. And that's partly what this panel is about. It's about looking forward. Um, it's a year with elections all over the world. It's not just us here in the UK. There's risk, uncertainty, opportunity in many locations. And I think it's fair to say in the last few years, we've seen this huge swell of regulation and policy frameworks around environmental disclosure in particular, which is obviously very close to the data and analytics theme today, but also a rising backlash against those disclosures and against that thinking, particularly from the US. We have the US Securities and Exchange Commission's disclosure rule currently held up in legal proceedings. We've seen the challenges on the basis of antitrust law. Um, here in the UK, we're starting to see anti-net zero campaigning as part of our election. In the EU, we've had a pledge to reduce the amount of all these regulations by 25%. So, um, you know, the backlash is also starting to be in full swing. So what the future holds will be some kind of synthesis of these different trends. But one thing we can also say is that we see increasing urgency for action as we move towards 2030. We're seeing increasing climate impacts and we're also, I think even if you're in the backlash all around, there's a general mood of a need for more directive government policy, a stronger role for the state, for the, for the governments to set economic policy that will direct these things. So I think those are all interesting trends to watch as well. So I will now stop talking. That was my opportunity to waffle. I will introduce the panel. So on my left, we have um, Emily McKenzie, who's the technical director. Sorry, on my left, I have Claire Axelson. Everyone's not sitting in my order. Um, <laughs> we have Claire Axelson, the head of policy and partnerships at Oxford Net Zero. I'm very pleased to welcome you, uh, uh, Claire. And then um, we have Diana Carney, who's a senior advisor from Beyond Net Zero. Mark Manning, principal advisor for regulatory affairs at the IFRS Foundation, among various other hats that he also wears. <laughs> Um, and then, last but not least, sorry, Emily <laughs> McKenzie, the technical director for the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures, um, the TNF, TNFD. So um, I will, I guess, ask our panel to give their opening remarks in the order in which they were sat, and so as not to confuse things any further. So, Kai, would you like to start us off? Absolutely, although I think it's only polite for nature to go first. <laughs> your, your original lineup was probably best. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, our, our research at the University of Oxford shows an 11-fold <coughs> increase in um, this type of uh, regulation where you could embed net zero standards. So this kind of normative regulation, whether that be disclosure, procurement, uh, mandatory transition plans, um, claims, or product standards. Um, and what we found in our kind of initial stock take, we're developing a policy monitor that tracks these regulations across um, 37 jurisdictions globally. And what we've found is that there's been an 11-fold increase in the last just few years on this type of policy developing. And that comes with upsides and downsides. Of course, the significant ramp up of regulation is welcome um, by the business community who has been calling for regulation to help them align the alphabet soup of standards, providing interoperability, clear fare, and coherent ground rules for the net zero economy. Um, but it also comes with um, challenges if that regulation is not coordinated. And so we see significant differences, of course, between the EU and the SEC laws. Um, but I think that there's a, this kind of patchwork of regulation that is starting to drive ambition sort of overall towards the most ambitious jurisdictions because we have a globalized economy. Even if you know the SEC laws don't include scope three, California is requiring scope three reporting and a lot of the very companies that would be um, kind of looking at, at both jurisdictions are instead just going for it. We also see that regulation is kind of following this, what we call a conveyor belt of adoption. And the conveyor belt at the moment is not, um, is not advanced as quickly as we, we would need it to be. If you think about the fact that disclosure was a voluntary process developed about 20 years ago and only now are we seeing about 50% of the world being covered by mandatory disclosure, we need much faster pace of adoption. But we're starting to see signs that that adoption is accelerating because whole governments are starting to develop framework legislation that then trickle down into the type of policies and, and instruments that we'd be looking for. Um, just as a final comment, I think it's clear that a new type of international coordination is needed to develop the interoperability that businesses are calling for so that they don't end up having to fill out different forms uh, as we know that they do uh, from a financial perspective as well. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Kaya. Uh, thank you. Well, many of the things that I was going to say you said, uh, I know, some of them. I, I, I mean, this, this, this journey, as you suggest, we need this journey, and I think the, the new model that we have of you know, implementing these standards as voluntary standards, kind of practicing them, consulting on them, getting them in there, does enable uh, policymakers to pick them up with relatively low risk. But as you say, we're not, we're not moving fast enough on that. Um, and you know, I, I personally, right now, I live in Canada, um, the ISSP is a case in point. You know, we attracted part of the ISSP you know, to Canada. You know, there was an understanding that we would adopt. The, 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 you know, the um, standards came out. It took you know, a year for us to say that we would strike a, a, a committee to think about possibly adjusting these things for our economy uh, and on what basis we needed to adjust them was extremely unclear, but you know, we better put it off. We don't have to do our scope three for you know, an extra year, et cetera. So uh, you know, the, that is, is not harming, right? Um, because uh, we all see that you know, mandatory <laughs> means people move faster. Uh, and although one of, I, I do a number of jobs, one of them is to, to advise Beyond Net Zero, which is General Atlantic's Climate Fund. Uh, I also work with Eurasia Group advising uh, around policy. And when you see the effect, what could you know, the kind of, horror that companies uh, show in their eyes when the EU deforestation regulation comes up. I mean, that really matters. They've got to do something. They've got to do it quickly. And likewise, when you see the failure of, of, of water policy regulation and the kind of chaos that exists as we have sort of uh, bits of you know, regulation emerging at the last minute because there isn't any really strategic approach to water regulation globally or you know, in any jurisdiction globally. You know, these things matter, obviously, to companies. I think all of us in this room probably believe in policy. Um, that's my first point. Uh, uh, what, you know, as I say, sort of in, in, in my uh, you know, principal activity is uh, advising around the climate impact of potential investments within a private equity fund. So that is something that may not be relevant to all of you, the private markets. 
Uh, we are, in a sense, we are responding to a policy. We are an SFDR, you know, we, we, we focus on our Article 9 fund, which means sustainability is uh, the key objective of the fund. And as such, you know, we invest in climate solutions. In a sense, we've got the easy bit. We say, okay, we're gonna invest in the stuff that we know is a solution for the climate. Um, I think, you know, one of the big issues, obviously, is uh, what Vanessa uh, talked about, which is the transition piece, the brown to green piece. We're, we're not doing the brown to green piece. We're doing the kind of accelerate the green. But within that, you need frameworks to help you understand where you get the biggest bang for, for buck. And this is a really complicated, um, in a sense, what's complicated about it is three years ago when we started, there was very little in the way of a, an accepted framework for determining what, you know, the sort of bang for buck piece. You could more or less see what might be helping the climate, but when you, you know, think of the real calculations and how you, how you assess that, I think over the three years that I've been working with the team at uh, General Atlantic and Systemic that supports us, uh, there's been, you know, there is broad agreement as to what we're looking at, and this is in the case of how to calculate it, avoided emissions when you are involved with um, a, a climate solution. Uh, and I think you know, the methodologies are quite similar to the proposed methodologies for the um, expected emissions reduction, for example, in, in, uh, when the kind of brown to green um, transitions. But, but there's still nuances in that piece that different, different firms do it in different ways, and you can come up with very different numbers based on how you do your calculations, even if you're the center of your, your, your methodologies remains the same. There are, I, mean, I could go into details, but you'd probably bore you to death. But the, the point is that there's this kind of almost, you know, there's a desired level of precision, but there's also has to always be a recognition that that precision is, is um, we, you know, there's a level of uncertainty about it. And particularly when you get to these enabling solutions, which we all know we need, so it's not the direct product that's gonna cause the uh, avoided emissions, but it's the software underneath it that enables it and trying to trace through those things. So anyway, what I would say is, um, you know, the more we can develop and regularize these frameworks, and I think there are initiatives within, you know, private initiatives to try and come together on this, but different firms, you know, they kind of cling to, their thing, and they've stated it. Last thing I'll say is, you know, we, we do that, we focus on avoided emissions, but we also require companies to decarbonize internally. Uh, so we, companies um, must set and uh, get approved their science-based targets. Now, we all know that there are <coughs> challenges with the science-based targets um, and, and fulfilling them. I think we need to have much more honest discussions around those and around targets in general and the difference between setting a target and meeting a target and when you actually, you know, are deemed to have failed. Uh, and we also look, last thing is, we try to look at kind of system impact of what we're doing. So it's not just these narrow, you know, how many products do we sell, how much do emissions does each product uh, displace, but we try and look at, um, you know, will this enable the transition? Is this a key underlying technology, a general purpose technology that can enable the transition? Therefore, is there a bigger bang for buck? Um, we would always resist setting a, an exact number for that bang for buck because of the uncertainty around it. But um, I think, so you can't do, I guess really what I'm saying is you can't do this without having some kind of frameworks and methodologies that you are doing. And I think the more that we can agree on those, uh, and uh, you know, in general, the less, the, the more that we can stop disagreeing in the climate space, I think it would be extremely helpful both to internally and to the kind of perception out there of, of, of what we're trying to receive, uh, achieve, which of course is, you know, as rapid as possible decarbonization of our economies. Brilliant, thank you. I think that may have been the perfect um, way to queue up the man from the IFRS. <laughs> How are you gonna bring us all together? Thank you very much indeed. Um, great to be here and thanks so much for the uh, opportunity. So what I wanted to really um, give a sense of is how, with reference to some of what we've already heard, the IFRS Foundation has been um, taking forward this journey towards uh, adoption of the standards. I think, uh, you know, we've all already heard that there is an urgency here. We need to move quickly. 
The fact that about a year ago now, um, just at the end of June last year, uh, the initial standards, um, IFRS S1 and S2, were published, that has laid a bit of a foundation, really, that we can, that we can build on. But we will only be able to build on that foundation if the standards are indeed adopted and adopted in a consistent and comparable way internationally um, and adopted quickly. Um, so a big focus of the uh, foundation over the, past, over the past year has been around encouraging and supporting uh, global adoption of the standards. And uh, just last week, actually, uh, we we published a little bit of an update on progress in that regard. And taking the sort of glass half full um, perspective here, we do now have more than 20 jurisdictions on the journey. Um, there are different stages of that journey. Some are uh, at the point where they have uh, announced an intention, they've set out a roadmap. Others are more, um, uh, more, more fully into that implementation phase. But um, those 20 jurisdictions together account for um, more than 50% of global GDP. Um, they account for more than 40% of um, market cap. So we've got a pretty good base there, I think. That really sends quite a, quite a strong signal. It sets a good tone for uh, adoption of the standards uh, by others. And the good news is also that there's quite a wide geographical spread here. We've got, um, we, we, we've got all the regions um, represented to some extent, and we uh, have also got a good mix of advanced economies and emerging market uh, developing economies among those that are on the journey. So I think there's some really quite encouraging signs there. Um, just a bit of a uh, 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 an indication of the, uh, the, the countries on the journey. Uh, so we've already heard Canada are on the journey, even if perhaps <laughs> not quite as far ahead.